Thank you for joining today. My name is Ethan Knight, and I work with Western Water Assessment here at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, we are excited to kick off our new Challenges to Building Resilient Water Systems webinar series today. Uh, we created this monthly series of interactive webinars to connect water managers with the most recent and relevant research about climate hazards and climate change impacts to regional water systems. Each webinar will include a 20 to 30 minute presentation, followed by small group discussions so that water managers can connect with and learn from each other. Um, and as you can see, that is the schedule um, that we have for the webinar series. The next slide. And today's speaker is Western Water Assessment Director, Ben Limna, who has worked closely with the program for more than 10 years, first as a postdoctoral researcher, and then as a principal investigator on our core program team. He earned his first two civil engineering degrees at University of Western Ontario and his PhD at the University of Washington, where he worked on a wide range of problems related to large-scale computational hydrology. His current hydrology research integrates social science methods and is consistently driven by the priorities of water managers and other decision makers in the region. Ben is also a fellow at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, or CERES, and is a professor in uh, C. Boulder Civil Environmental and Architectural Engineering. Um, in today's webinar, Ben will cover findings from a multi-scale analysis that examines the effects of wildfires on sediment, nutrients, dissolved organic matter, and runoff across multiple watersheds. Next slide. Before we get started, I want to share a bit about Western Water Assessment for those of you who haven't worked with us in the past. Western Water Assessment is an applied research program that produces usable science to help address real-world climate problems. We are based at the University of Colorado Boulder, University of Utah, and U University of Wyoming. And we work in the Intermountain West, specifically Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Western Water Assessment is one of several teams in the NOAA Climate Adaptation uh, Partnerships, or CAP network, formerly known as the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments, or RISO network. Next slide. At Western Water Assessment, we are working to build resiliency in water systems and communities in our region while working on many climate-related issues, ranging from water resource management and drought to climate adaptation and resilience to compound hazards. Next slide. Uh, Western Water Assessment differs from a traditional research program because our goal is to produce usable science that helps address real-world problems by directly working with communities, resource managers, nonprofits, and other partners to tailor our work to their needs or priorities. This sometimes takes shape as original research and other times involves research integration, including things like workshops, webinars such as this, online tools and resources, or technical reports like climate summaries and assessments. Other times it uh, involves providing expertise or presenting at a community or partner meeting. Next slide. Uh, we can connect across a number of activities listed on the slide, including climate information sy synthesis and tools, vulnerability and adaptation exploration, connecting with partners, and more. If you're interested in connecting with us, you can email us at wwa at colorado.edu. And the last slide. Um, today's presentation will be recorded and lasts about 20 to 30 minutes, followed by Q&A and a breakout group session. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A window at the bottom of your Zoom screen, as you can see on the slide on the left. Uh, we are running the breakout group discussions after the webinar, so you can connect with and learn from each other. Once I assign everyone a breakout room, you can join by clicking on the Join Breakout Room button from the pop-up message um, that'll appear on your screen, as seen on the slide on the right. We will also launch a two-question poll before the breakout groups to ask about um, interests in future webinars from us. And lastly, we'll be sure to share a link to the webinar recording with you once it's up on our website. And uh, before I hand it over to Ben, please make sure um, to take our quick survey before you leave today's webinar. It should only take one to two minutes of your time, and it'll help us plan new webinars and communicate with our funders about our program's impact. Um, I'll leave it in the chat window. And uh, oh, thank you, Vinay. And um, yeah, and I'll send it again at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand it off to Ben. Thanks. Thank you, Ethan, uh, and everybody for being here. It's really exciting to uh, see so many people joining and to be able to share this work. So yeah, the big question that we were trying to get at with this was, you know, what are the water quality um, impacts of wildfire? And more than that, kind of the, the question is, you know, what aspects of wildfire or rainfall after are really gonna be the most important. And so 
I want to acknowledge that this work that you're going to see is essentially the PhD work of Dr. Carly Brucker, who uh, was advised by myself as well as Fernando Rosario Ortiz, shown here. Uh, Carly is, uh, she graduated last year and has continued to be interested in this area. Uh, she's currently a staff professional at Corolla Engineering, uh, Engineers in Broomfield. And um, yeah, I think is very much interested in, uh, you know, this work and any of the uh, feedback we get. So wanted to be sure to acknowledge her. All right. So I wanted to start with kind of the motivation for why this is important, and then uh, talk about two different analyses that we did to try to get at this big question of, you know, post wildfire water quality. So starting with the um, motivation. So, you know, at the time that we started thinking about this, you know, this was one of the um, findings that had come out. And it essentially showed that from, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, to the more recent decades, that there has been a really big increase, not just in the number of fires, um, but also in the total burned area. And of course, it, it varies across uh, regions and so on. But this really got, I think, the attention of us and probably most of you on this call. And it also drew a lot of attention in the news media, um, not just in the United States, but you know, here's a case from um, Australia, but also close to home, like in Colorado. And in particular, I think we probably all um, heard about all the, the fires happening in California, especially 2020 and 2021 were really big fire years, where something like half of their historical sort of burned areas um, or um, were in those two years. So there's a lot of attention there. And uh, why does this matter? So wildfires can uh, increase, um, can, they can do make a number of changes to the landscape. And these changes actually uh, can have big impacts on the uh, water supply, water quantity and water quality. So looking at the schematic here, you know, they can affect reservoirs and water treatment plants, as well as just natural ecosystems, freshwater resources in general, uh, through increases in runoff rates um, and sediment loading which are associated with flooding and debris flows, as we see here, which is from the, um, this is the Kenyatta del Oro wash, which uh, was downstream from the Bighorn fire in Arizona back in 2020. So you can see that, you know, the, the quality of that water is completely um, affected by post-fire debris. Uh, there can also be, therefore, implications for infrastructure and the way reservoirs are managed. Um, and in terms of water treatment, you know, the more dissolved organic matter you have, the more, and with the use of chlorine-based disinfectants, the more likelihood of carcinogenic disinfection byproducts. Uh, nutrients in that water can cause algal blooms and eutrophication uh, more generally. And then heavy metals that can be transported can exceed uh, federal limits for health. So given all of this importance, you would think that we would know everything about these events. And yet we have a limited understanding uh, due to a couple of things. First is just the scarcity of water quality data. It's expensive, it's time consuming. And you know, it's not as if we can predict where the fires are gonna happen and set up our monitoring consistently there uh, so, yeah, we may have a lack of pre-burn data. There's a lot of variability. And, of course, then when a fire does happen, there can be issues with accessibility and safety in burned landscapes. So given kind of this big lack of control when we try to understand post-wildfire water quality, this kind of motivated us to do our first sort of analysis that I'm going to share with you today, which is this lab scale uh, analysis. And the problem that we're trying to get at is it's an attribution problem. Uh, the question, you know, post-fire water quality can be difficult to kind of attribute to one thing or the other since fire severity, 
rainfall intensity and terrain vary so widely, not just across different fires, but actually even across an individual fire within that uh, burn scar, you can have these uh, variations. And so this led us to want to try to control each one of these and understand how they affect water quality. So yes, the goal was to evaluate the impact of E drivers in post-fire water quality in terms of both hydrologic and, and water quality uh, in kind of a three-dimensional matrix control, which sounds quite sophisticated, but to make it more tangible, we can think about the Rubik's cube as a kind of analogy. So if you think about, you know, these post-fire water quality questions involve some type of burn intensity of the fire some type of rainfall intensity that followed the fire and then some type of terrain. We were wanting to understand how the unique sort of combination of these would produce hydrologic and water quality responses. And so setting that aside for a moment, um, we looked at these three dimensions, uh, burn intensity, rainfall intensity, and then terrain slope. And we did some field sampling and some lab testing um, for each of these dimensions, we analyzed two to four different increments. And at each increment, so at each position, say on the Rubik's Cube, we did eight replicate samples. So we repeated our sampling eight times to try to understand you know, the uh, signal from the noise. And so uh, we, we evaluated runoff and infiltration, as well as water quality in terms of sediment and these other constituents. So the lab testing involved four steps. Uh, first was field sampling, then burn simulation of those samples, then rainfall simulation and water quality analysis. So field sampling uh, was done from the um, Fraser Experimental Forest, which is in Colorado, and it is near the site of the 2020 Williams Fork Fire. And we did most of our field sampling in you know, 2021 and 2020 as well. And so that was fresh uh, in our minds there. And so kind of a relevant area for field sampling. Um, and of course we had excellent help from students to both collect and try to collect minimally disturbed samples and then haul them back to the lab. Uh, the next step was burn simulation with these samples. Uh, Carly, who I mentioned at the beginning, designed and built this uh, mobile burn uh, simulator, which actually uses these really high wattage heat lamps and thermocouples to induce combustion. And the um, fire safety was such that we were not allowed to use it indoors, but instead had to use it outdoors. Also, uh, fun fact was that it, it drew so much electricity for the um, heat lamps to run that we had to kind of use a special breaker and everything during those experiments and shield uh, surrounding areas for heat. And so you can see the time temperature curves. We used uh, maximum uh, temperature as a measure of fire severity. Then uh, samples were then brought back into the lab and subjected to rainfall using the simulator here that Carly designed. And we tried to capture rates associated with say like a 10 year storm 20 year storm, 50 year storm. We looked at regional data to estimate that. And Carly actually designed and built these custom funnels then, which you can kind of see here. And they allowed us to collect and measure runoff as well as infiltration. Um, and then that could be used in the final step, which was the water quality analysis, where we uh, had a, a very large number of samples that we tested in the various uh, chemistry and analysis machines. So that was a lot. And I'm just gonna kind of touch on some of the, the high points before I kind of say though that we did generate a lot of results, a ton of results. So you can see um, some of those here and I'm not even gonna talk about, you know, a, a small fraction of these today, other than to say that we did look at a lot of different uh, hydrologic and water quality constituents. And for each of these, uh, the way to read these graphs is that, you know, we looked at unburned samples, mild, moderate, and severe burned samples across the different dimensions. Uh, we also 
looked at, uh, in this case, we're just looking at two rainfall intensities across those. And then also we repeated the analysis for two different terrain slopes. And uh, what we found was that, you know, results were generally uh, consistent with the hypothesis and with the uh, previous literature in terms of the general trends. Uh, however, uh, some of the specific results we found first was that runoff tended to increase with increasing fire severity. So this is a uh, curve that shows the time of each experiment. And then what we have on the vertical here is the runoff ratio. So that's the amount of runoff produced uh, divided by the amount of precipitation we applied. And you can see that the severe uh, burn samples produce the most runoff and it kind of decreased monotonically, at least for the first hour. Similarly, the sediment uh, that was mobilized in the water, as well as the turbidity of the sampled water, also increased with fire severity. So you can see these positive and um, generally significant, but not always statistically significant slopes with increasing fire severity, which sort of confirmed our expectation then when we looked at the dissolved constituents, so more of the water quality, uh, we actually found what I'm calling here a middle peaked response. Um, and we look, I'm showing here is dissolved organic carbon in orange and total dissolved nitrogen in purple. And what I mean by a middle peaked response is that, you know, there tended to be less um, mobilization uh, less release of carbon and nitrogen at low temperatures, whereas at the highest temperatures, uh, those extreme temperatures often will volatize constituents so that it's really kind of this middle range that's optimum for those. So uh, to summarize this lab scale analysis, I would say that um, we found that increasing both burn and rainfall intensities generally produce more runoff and sedimentation um, with the most severe burning in terms of uh, soil temperatures, amplifying the responses. Uh, water quality tended to show kind of this middle peaked um, pattern or like an upside down U shape or maybe bell, bell curve shape would be a word um, due to the, you know, the optimal uh, temperature for mobilization without sort of volatizing compounds. And then uh, I do want to make a very clear distinction here is that while we did have control over some of the conditions, the lab simulations are, are necessarily quite limited in how well they can capture, you know, the true conditions in the field, both in terms of the small scale, uh, as well as the lack of variability and even challenges in reaching, you know, the very highest temperatures uh, and so on. So this paper, this is now a journal article that's in revision uh, at this Australian journal and I anticipate it will be out soon. And so if people are interested, feel free to reach out and I could uh, maybe to Ethan and we can try to share a preprint with you. All right, so given the limitations at the low, at the, sorry, the local like laboratory scale, we were interested in kind of the bigger picture impacts because, um, you know, wildfires occur at larger scales and at the basin scale. So that motivated us to extend this work to these larger scales um, and maybe trade one set of issues for another set of issues. So first I would just say that basin scale modeling, host fire water quality, I think is important to inform planning and mitigation efforts. You know, these can be short-term efforts, uh, like I'm listing here, or long-term efforts, like infrastructure or changes in water treatment. However, um, these studies are limited because of a lack of high-quality data, a lack of pre-burn data, and the inherently high variability in the spatial and temporal resolution of these things. So what we tried to do then was we tried to optimize the um, scarcity of, of data and the irregular sort of availability and irregular sampling of the data across the West. And so what we did was 
kind of three steps. The first step was we identified a large number of fires and basins and created a database of uh, wildfire affected uh, water quality. Then we developed a data-driven model to understand how the water quality um, changed to quantify changes in water quality after the fire. And that was kind of the main thing. And the last thing we tried to do is to understand why some sites produced say more or higher uh, water quality responses than other sites. Okay, so to do this, um, we needed a whole lot of data and you can kind of think of this table, we can kind of group this table into three categories. So the first are these, what we're calling hydroclimate variables. So things like stream flow and things like precipitation, temperature, uh, potential evaporation data. We, we gathered those for all of our basins. Then we tried to sort of characterize the fires and the basins themselves in terms of burn uh, fire scar information, as well as land cover and topography. And we used all of that to predict kind of our targets, the water quality constituents, sediment, carbon, nitrogen, also phosphorus. Um, and we used the water quality data portal. So kind of in a nutshell, we developed our data-driven model with the hydroclimate variables. We tried to characterize intersite variability with the physiographic variables and all of that in the um, attempt in the charge of, of predicting post-fire water quality. So I wanna say just a little bit more about the data before I get into the results. Um, we used primarily water quality data from the water quality portal, which has a lot of different constituents and it actually represents kind of a, a synthesis of USGS and EPA and other uh, data sets. And then we use the MTBS uh, fire data set, as you can see here. One of the challenges actually is that a lot of the um, water quality data were actually uh, available in places that did not have like a, a pre-delineated watershed, meaning that maybe the USGS or others had not monitored there. So we ended up doing uh, quite a few custom delineations so that we would say, okay, there's a water quality uh, observation here. What is the drainage area that drains into that? And then we could analyze what was going on upstream to understand uh, that. And uh, the site selection process was actually quite labor intensive. And I apologize for the formatting of the, the header here, it kind of obscures, but we essentially began with close to 50,000 basins that we delineated um, and more than 10,000 wildfires. And when we kind of overlaid those two together, we ended up uh, reducing that number quite a bit. And we called burned uh, basins places that had more than 5% burned impact. Uh, and when we put in requirements for higher quality uh, screening criteria for the data, that reduced us way down to 330 basins. Um, and we required, for example, at least 10 data points pre-fire, 10 data points post-fire, and at least three years of record on either side of the fire which doesn't sound like that much, but I think it was a good, uh, it was a, our attempt to strike a balance with having like a lot of different basins while also trying to um, have as much data as we could in those locations. Uh, so these are the basins shown here. And then we also um, identified close, a similar number of unburned kind of paired basins that had less than uh, a 20th of a percent burned so that we can sort of control uh, and understand what was happening in those areas uh, independent of the fire and try to remove some of that influence in our interpretation. Lastly, we generally try to reduce the effect of urban areas, developed areas, and it seems like um, for consistency, we, we chose a, a kind of a range of forested areas. So they tended to be more forested, less developed watersheds. Okay, so, at the end of this all, we ended up with a bunch of these locations. And what I'm showing here are the different constituent where the 
primary just means the one that had the most data available. And you can see there's a, a, fair, uh, a fairly diverse mix and a pie chart shows like the total amount of data from each type. And you can see that these uh, total dissolved solids and turbidity, as well as the carbon and actually some of the, the phosphorus um, and nitrogen were the most common uh, constituents. And so we're, we're publishing that data set as well uh, for others to use. Okay, so what did we do to estimate post-fire water quality changes? I think this is the most technical slide that I'm gonna show. So please bear with me. So essentially what we did is for our target variable, let's say this is uh, total dissolved solids or phosphorus or whatever, we tried to estimate that um, using pre-fire years. So predictors like the hydroclimate variables and then apply the model out to post-fire. So it might look something like this. So the pre-fire uh, observations are as follows. We train the model to try to match as well as possible. Um, and then we took that same model and applied it out after the fire. And the difference essentially between the um, blue and the orange was how we characterized the magnitude of the fire impact. Now we also did kind of the same thing, but for the unburned nearby basins to get another measure of like what the likely impact of the fire was versus the climate and the hydrology. So I'm just gonna show a few key results here. Um, we did this for like 12 different constituents, but I'm just showing four here. Uh, what we did is we aggregated all of the basins and all of the fires to be oriented where year zero is the year of the fire and negative means years before and positive means year after. Then we fit our model to the pre-fire data which is the blue, so the, the blue bars show the confidence interval of what the pre-fire years predict. And the gray shows the 90% confidence interval for the paired unburned basins. And so really it's kind of like any time that the um, post-fire fall up outside of the blue and gray bands, that tells us that there's some type of a um, signal from the fire itself and the signal can actually last for you know one to eight years, depending on the constituents. But in general, most constituents saw a significant increase in the first two years following the fire. And so what we then tried to do, so this kind of confirmed our hypothesis about post-fire water quality. We tried to say, well, what is it about some basins that produce sort of uh, higher levels versus other basins? And so we did this inter-site analysis where here is a, the list of the constituents and here are some features on the vertical from the water, watersheds and the, the correlations are shown in the colors with the bold colors, bold font being statistically significant correlations. And what kind of jumps out, although there are several, what jumped out was the percentage of the forested area tended to be the most uh, reliable predictor of post-fire water quality impacts, which, you know, I interpret this to mean that if you have a watershed that's like 100% forested, it would be more likely to have these post-fire impacts than one that was much less forested. So that's kind of my main, that, those are the main findings. Uh, a question that you probably have is, you know, what can you do to prepare? Uh, one way, right, that we have here is the Colorado a forest atlas that can even show, uh, you know, things like the burn probability in different areas. Um, there is actually a number of other resources that we are happy to share with you that Ethan and Liz Payton actually pulled together. And I think we're also interested to understand what tools you currently use. So I'm hoping that this will sort of spur this, some discussion. And so to conclude, uh, we showed in a lab skill analysis that higher burn and rainfall intensities generally increase runoff and sediment, uh, while dissolved constituents were highest at the moderate or middle peaked kind of way. The basin scale analysis uh, kind of confirmed that you can have elevated water quality uh, levels for one to maybe eight years post-fire, uh, while some 
tended to peak earlier or later or show significant responses later. And that overall, it seems like the severity of these water quality changes is at least partially linked to some of the characteristics of the watershed. So uh, with that, I will thank you for your time. And I guess, Ethan, we can kind of transition into the Q&A or the, the next uh, section. So thanks.